move on to our next talk, but I know that you two know these next two that we are speaking to, so I think you're going to pop up in that talk, but I'll say a little goodbye to you for now, but thank you so much for your talk. It was really informative and really lovely just to see the work that you're doing and the difference that you're making, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Brilliant. Now, for those of you online, we are now going to move on to our next session, and you are in for a treat. Now, this is all on the history of exploration of Jupiter and its moons, because yes, it is Mars Day, but as I said, Mars has kindly invited Jupiter as the guest planet on its day. And we are going to be joined by Dr. Jim Green, who is previously of NASA, and Professor David Southwood, who is previously of the European Space Agency and the UK Space Agency, and they have been involved with so many missions to Jupiter. I think they've been involved with five missions that have been, so what they're going to attempt to do in their talk is talk about those five missions, and I've heard that these two have a lot of expertise to share, and they are here right now. So we have Jim Green and David Southfield. Hello. Hi there, I'm David Southwood, actually. Southwood! I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, of course. I'm sorry, I'm dyslexic, and sometimes it just makes up a word, and wood is like fields to my brain, so... <laughs> you know, you, you're not the first one to do it. I think, um, I've had all sorts of uh, ends to my name. I'm thinking of changing it to Northwood. That might make it easier. <laughs> No, I'll just say it right. And I think Kerry yeah. is as Kerry's with you as well, because I know that you 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 lot have met in the past and having a quick a quick a quick high on Mars there, yeah? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah we're, we're sort of interlopers, Kerry, I'm afraid. <laughs> there you are. Uh, yeah, and Sophia just texted me that apparently this was the exact moment that Zoom decided it should install an update. So. Of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so we've had we've had Kerry and Sophia talking all about Mars, and of course now we're going to move on to Jupiter. Um, so Kerry, thank you so much for your talk. It was brilliant, and of course thanks Sophia um, through you know through the phone rather than through Zoom, considering uh, she can't join us. So I would say it is now time for Jim and David. I've been told to give you as much time as I can because you guys have a lot of information to share, and so it's over to you two. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, that's really good. I, um, Jim and I go back a long way. In fact, uh, we're probably going to talk at some point about uh, geysers or geysers on the moons of uh, Jupiter and Saturn. And Jim said to me, no, no, keep, keep quiet about the geysers. We're the old geysers. And um, if you can see on the screen there, this is how long Jim and I go back in the exploration of uh, Jupiter and indeed Saturn, uh, which are the giant planets of our solar system. And this is a picture of the first, it was called very appropriately, Pioneer. And it was going to be the first spacecraft. In fact, there were two, there was a pair of them, both spacecraft got through the asteroid belt. And <laughs> what's beyond the asteroid belt? Well, of course, Jupiter and Saturn. So uh, they, the two spacecraft were targeted at Jupiter and then one went to Saturn. Jim, tell me about your feelings about this. Well, David, as you know, uh, our, um, our careers actually parallel each other in many yeah. ways. I was at the University of Iowa where James Van Allen, who, who was the big pusher in terms of getting Pioneer 10 and 11, uh, launched in 72 is Pioneer 10, 73 is Pioneer 11, uh, to, to do those tours of the giant planets. And uh, they were studying uh, the high energy data that were coming back from the radiation belts from, from Jupiter uh, when I became a, a graduate student and uh, listened to all kinds of talks he was giving and interpreting what the observations were. So these two spacecraft had two magnetometers on it and plenty of particle instruments. And the first kind of elementary cameras, uh, which, which were not very good, uh, but the images were still pretty exciting. So I'm sure you got excited by some of those observations. Oh, yeah. No, no. But I mean, the, the, the funny thing was, 
you go and you instrument the spacecraft to see the things you know you're going to see. <laughs> and so to some degree, I've got to say, Pioneer kind of missed some of the high spots. Yeah, it did. And it, I mean, that's not to downgrade it. It is a beautiful job of what it was supposed to see. It saw all the things it was supposed to see. Right. But, you know, it didn't exactly miss the little green men, but it missed yeah. some of the things that led us to think of uh, the Jupiter and Saturn systems very differently. So shall right. we move on a few years? 1977, and that was the launch of two more spacecraft, two more American spacecraft, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. And they were, let's say, even better instrumented. And um, they were going to do, well, the grand tour. They were going to yeah. go beyond the asteroids, because we now knew you could get beyond the asteroids, you could safely get through them. Right. And they were going to go to Jupiter, to Saturn, eventually to Uranus and to Neptune. Right. Only Pluto got left out of the grand tour. Well, part uh, of that, once again, was uh, James Van Allen wanting to have a grand tour. Now that they had the basic information about Saturn and uh, Jupiter, and they were excited about going back. And as you point out, uh, uh, these voyagers were just wonderful, great imagers on scan platforms that could, you know, so the spacecraft could be looking over here with some instruments and scanning over here and really tremendously versatile. Uh, uh, just like the pioneers, they were running on radioisotope power, which means they didn't need solar panels and could go out into deep space. In fact, Pioneer 10, 11, Voyager 1 and 2 are basically on their way of leaving the solar system. Yeah, and in fact, uh, all these spacecraft we're now talking about are actually left the solar system, <laughs> at least uh, as far as uh, the helios we would define goes. the solar system. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, this image here is one of the moons of Jupiter. And until this image appeared, I think it's fair to say the moons were known about. They were kind of interesting things, but Jupiter was the real object. It's got a very complicated atmosphere, True. very exciting place. It, it emits lots of radio waves, so we knew there'd be a lot of radiation there. Very exciting too. Yeah. But yeah. then I think this picture was originally taken for navigation. Isn't that <laughs> right? That uh, uh, True. Uh, they were indeed uh, uh, looking at the moons and, and mapping them out. And uh, one of the um, uh, 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 navigation people are, are trying to fit a curve to uh, these circular, uh, you know, spheres and, and trying to figure out exactly where they are. And, and this image pops up for which, how do, how do you fit a surface of a, of a moon with something that's sticking out behind it or on it or somewhere? And that really alerted the scientist and got them very excited. <laughs> yeah, I think that changed. That changed the whole system, as we'll see next, but that's a volcano. And here was this object that looked like a ball bearing that had gone drastically wrong, and bits of it were spewing out into space. Volcan it's, in fact, the most volcanic object in the solar system, I think. Yeah, I think at any one time, there's more than 100 volcanoes going on. And in yeah. fact, a uh, planetary scientist uh, friend of mine, who's also a volcanologist expert, says we need a new Google map of Io every 88 years. It kind of resurfaces <laughs> itself. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why Io looks so, it's the innermost Galilean moon. The, the moons are called the Galilean moons because Galileo discovered them back in uh, 1610. It's just a little bit before our time. Right. Um, but this is the innermost, the one closest to Jupiter. And um, this really was sensational. Oh, wow. the, because they're small objects, they should have cooled down aeons yeah. ago. Yeah. What on earth was going on? To get a volcano, you've got to have something hot. And it was realized it was the moons, the other moons working with Jupiter that made the interior molten and allowed volcanology right. to suddenly become a planetary science. Right. Okay. In fact, 
in fact, as you say, the, the tidal forces, you know, we feel tides here, that, you know, our, our water dissipates some of that energy as the things go back and forth. But on these rocky-like planets like uh, Io is, uh, that, that squishing that goes on from, from a gravitational perspective melts the rock, and then it, it, it stays volcanically active. Right. Well, the, then the interesting thing, I mean, suddenly our interest as planetary scientists shifted a little bit. I think Jupiter felt a bit, mis you know, it missed out on some of the attention because suddenly we were all crazy for the moons. And of course, the other three Galilean moons. Now, Jupiter, I think, has 70, 79 moons now. Yeah, I've lost count. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, uh, let's forget about the other 75 for now, because these are the biggest here. Right. The three there, uh, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, they're made of something different. Io is made of molten sulfur and really quite unpleasant stuff. Right. These three are made of water, water ice, of course. And indeed, we thought they would be solid water. I mean, dirty water, I have to say, but solid. And of course, if the interiors were getting moved around like the interior of Io was, suddenly there were interesting features and uh, attention changed. I'm gonna, sh uh, in fact, the, um, the real issue then was, were these moons doing exotic things? Right, right. And, uh, Really, the, it turns out they were. You know, they, they were. were. They in fact, the, yeah. In fact, uh, I should move us to the 1990s. I mean, we're doing we're really getting through our life's history, Jim. Right. But uh, by the 1990s, we had another spacecraft there that was in orbit around Jupiter, right. and that very appropriately was called Galileo. And because of the discoveries made by Voyager, Galileo was very much uh, going to look at the moons of right. Jupiter, right. as right. well as Jupiter itself. And so there came the, some more real surprises. I mean, it's been yeah. great to have a career where every theorist was wrong. <laughs> Indeed. In fact, yeah. when the planetary scientists look at these, they recognize yeah. several things. One. These moons were all made at the same time, and yeah. yet their surfaces look so different. And indeed, you know, that, their interiors uh, also must be different in various ways, although the three at the bottom there are made of water ice primarily. Question was, could there be liquid water? Right, and these are really pretty big. I mean, yeah. uh, it turns out size-wise, you know, our moon is really big, and it's about mm. the size of Io. So uh, the next yeah, one these are, below Io is Enceladus, or sorry, Europa, and that's a little smaller. Yeah. And then Ganymede is the biggest moon in the solar system. And then uh, Callisto is just pot full of craters on the surface. <laughs> and, and so, I, I mean, so how did they the, turn out so different? I mean, ah. look, I don't have any trouble recognizing um, which one's which? I mean, well, they're not like twins, but they were all born at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, there's a distribution of material, and of course they coalesce, and the heavy stuff goes to the bottom. But then the tidal forces uh, really make the the big changes. I think uh, some of the initial concepts is uh, you know there's a lot of ice around these moons. These moons have uh, large ice shells uh, uh, around them. And, and Io probably did too, but the tidal forces dissipated that ice. That's why it's gone. Yeah, it's run out of ice. It yeah, ran yeah. out of ice, just like yeah. running out of gas. But it's the tidal forces. The further yeah. you are away from Jupiter, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, that energy is dissipated in the same way, but less and less and less. And that's why uh, Calypso has tons of craters. Europa, I'm sorry, uh, 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 Ganymede has a few on the surface. Europa has hardly any, and then Io just lots keeps, of cracks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and some cracks. Yeah, it has some a lot of good, a lot of really good cracks. You got, you got that right, right here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, um, 
And of course, they're now called, well, two of them at least, we know contain liquid water. And so they're called ocean worlds. And where did we come from, Jim? Well, I know you came from Iowa, <laughs> but originally we all came out of the oceans. And yeah. so this, these moons are really something incredibly important also for the history of Earth. These oceans could be uh, harboring whatever gave rise to us. And right. who knows? The key, the key to that is we got to figure out what their composition is. Yeah. Does it have the right material to, to you know, yeah. carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, yeah. all that good stuff that makes uh, life here uh, on Earth possible. And then, of course, the key ingredients, water. And, and the tidal forces are, are keeping underneath these ice shells a liquid ocean. Well, actually, I'm now going to flip. This is purely personal. I know you objected, Jim, when he saw that I put this slide in. This one is so another moon, yes. but not a moon of Jupiter. It is a moon of Saturn, Enceladus. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just outside the rings of Saturn. And it's a really insignificant moon compared with, for instance, Titan, which is a great big moon of Saturn. Here, this little thing. And the reason it's there is that an instrument I built, the magnetometer on the Cassini mission to Saturn, this was now, this got there in 2004. So we're really moving ahead in time. Uh, my colleague, Michel Doherty, discovered a magnetic signature that, well, only a magnetometer specialist would say, that has to be water coming out of the object. I mean, you talk to people who look at images, they say, how can you tell that? And it is because magnetometer people are very clever, of course. Sure. But even better, some magnetometer people like Michelle, also very diplomatic, and she persuaded the project, the Cassini project, to go back and take this picture, right. which of course shows these, uh, you prefer geysers because you keep geysers to being something else, Jim, right? <laughs> That's true. So That's true. There we are. The, yeah. the, well, this the is geysers, yeah, the geysers of Enceladus. Of course, there actually are plumes or geysers like this. We know for sure at Europa. And we right. suspect there might be similar things even at Ganymede. No sign well, I, of anything like yeah, that. Yeah, I, I think so too, because um, as I said, crater wise, the craters on the surface of Callisto, which are so many, must have existed on uh, Europa and also on um, uh, Ganymede, but but they have been covered up. And I think I think the only way to do that is the ocean is communicating with the surface. Yeah. And so once you get an impact and you see a crater, you can fill it in with water. It freezes. You know, uh, uh, the, the 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 plate moves around, and so uh, plates like here on Earth that we're used to that are soils uh, on uh, these moons, uh, these are ice plates. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's. I, I hate to bring you to the 21st century properly, Jim, but <laughs> here you are. Uh, this is a spacecraft that's going to be launched uh, next month. Uh, in fact, pretty well a month from now. And I think the most likely launch date is the 14th of April. Wow. Which is really soon. And the spacecraft's all put together. And it's sitting out in South America at the European launch site in Kourou in Guyane. And there, this I have to say is a uh, mock-up of CGI, if you like, of what the spacecraft will look like. And it is going to Ganymede. And what's so special about Ganymede? Ganymede has, <laughs> unbelievably, I was involved in this discovery I mean, it would knock me completely sideways. Me Ganymede too. has a magnetic field just like the Earth. I mean, it, how can this thing out there so far away, so cold, turn out to have a magnetic field just like Earth? So, And, and as Hubble proved, 
uh, at the bottom of the field lines, just to the yeah. aurora. <laughs> yes, our aurora. Oh my God, this moon has its own aurora. Yeah, uh, it's it, really, yeah, it's trying to be just Earth like. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, a, it's one of my favorite objects. Yeah, it's a wonderful place, and uh, happily, even if we're not quite getting there ourselves, uh, we'll go there vicariously with this one. Absolutely. And so that's the real, um, the real excitement here in Europe. Uh, Good. Next month, uh, we'll yep. fingers crossed. Yeah. And then uh, that'll be the well. first orbiter of a moon, um, moon of anywhere. But yep. uh, well, we've had orbiters of our own moon, but uh, anywhere else in the solar yep. system. And um, it'll be followed. The launch will be followed by something that actually gets to Jupiter before us. It's always typical of the Americans, they jump in. <laughs> well, they don't understand there, queuing. <laughs> well, okay, but before you go there, you know, there's some NASA instruments on this too, on, on yeah, Tuesday. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so you need to give me a, uh, an invite to the launch, please. Okay, now <laughs> we can go to the next one. <laughs> okay, it's actually quite difficult to get from Washington to, True. to Guyane. You, you end up hopping through the... Uh, through the Caribbean, which you is very tempting to stop off, I understand. No, well, no, that you no, would even I'm, think not, of it, Jim. Yeah, I wouldn't even <laughs> think of it. <laughs> I'll, I'll put in a good word for you. All right. Okay. Thank you. Right. Let's move on because, uh, yep. And we were going to have a quiz and a prize, but then we found out we didn't have any prizes. <laughs> and the quiz would have been what is that thing behind? Jim. Okay, well, this would have given anyone who hadn't got the solution the solution. Here we are, Europa. Uh, yes. Really, the Europeans should be going there, but the Americans have claimed it as American well, territory. It, 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 so it, tell it, us about it a bit. All Jim. right. This, uh, this uh, fabulous moon, as I mentioned, just a little smaller than our own moon, has hardly any craters on the surface. And we think the ice shell that it has may be anywhere from uh, a, a handful of kilometers to maybe 10 kilometers in thickness, but it has to communicate to the surface. And we see these huge cracks everywhere. So as David pointed out with the fabulous uh, uh, backlit Enceladus, uh, there's got to be water, uh, sheets of water coming out, geysers we call them, that come down and then cover cover the surface in many different ways and fill in those craters. In fact, some, some of the scientists think that this shell actually slips over time. And, uh, and that's why we get some of these unusual patterns that um, uh, cross each other uh, because of the different orientation. There's so, so it's like continental, like continental drift on the yeah, Earth. Yeah, in fact, uh, there's a, some new scientific discoveries where it's clear that one ice plate is moving underneath another. Subduction that is also color. like Earth, I have to say. Yes, yes. So, so you get, you'll definitely have moon, moon quakes. Yeah. So what's happening, of course, is ice is growing because of materials coming to the surface and pushing everything, and then, and then you get communication of that surface down in the ocean, which brings in oxygen, brings in all kinds of other uh, stuff. In fact, this. The uh, brown material is thought to be um, uh, a variety of hydrocarbons, and, and so that could be some wonderful food for uh, for potential uh, life that lives in the ocean. The okay, other thing well, let's... that I think is spectacular about this moon, and I'll end I think with that, is, yeah. is the surface moves up and down 30 meters every orbit. So um, uh, that's that's some tidal force. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's uh, quite a ride out there, <laughs> going around Jupiter, and you yes. bounce up and down. Uh, yes. This is it's kind Clipper. of nice to stand on that surface, you know. But there, you, I don't think we're going to do that for some no, time to not, come. Not anytime soon. But so we can do Clipper. it vicariously with these right. these spacecraft. I'm just looking forward to them arriving right. 2030. So it's not so long now. No, this, even though this will be launched in October of next year. In fact, yeah. I just saw it in the clean room last week at JPL. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, I think that we should probably allow a word from the rest of the world. Uh, That's right. Open it up for open, questions. Open up for questions. So there you go. Fran. 
Do we have any questions? Or we do, we... we do. They have been coming in. And if you guys online have any questions to ask, just don't go to the Q&A section of the link and you can ask your questions to Jim and David there. And we've had a few coming in. And what I loved about that, Dirk, was obviously you know each other quite well and your wealth of experience <laughs> was just sort of oozing from every pore. So as those questions are coming in, I've got a, I, I think it's a small question, but we'll see. Out of the missions that you've worked on, um, which are your, which is your favorite each and have you collaborated on any? <laughs> well, we've collaborated. I think that's how we got to know each other over the years. Um, which are the favourite? I have very difficult difficulty with that. Um, it's it's generally the one I'm working on at yes. the moment. I, I mean, when I'm not near the girl I love, then I love the girl that's near. But I, I uh, love the one. I mean, it, it's very hard to. It's always what you know. You get deeply involved yeah. in what you're doing at any time. And if that, that's just a natural way. It's always the latest thing right. that you're really thinking about. It's when somebody's demanding you to solve a problem, that's your favorite mission. I, I, I don't know, Jim, do you feel the same way? I do, I do. You know, so when I was at Iowa, Van Allen and his team were analyzing the particle data and as the radiation belts sweep around with the rotation of Jupiter, the moons are, are absorbing some of that radiation. So they were, they were. This was tremendously exciting. We 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 then could look at uh, particle transport across magnetic field lines, and and what's happening to that ends up uh, producing a variety of radiation, as we talked about. And then the Voyagers. The Voyagers was really the first time I had an opportunity to get access to the data and do my own science. And then Galileo was an orbiter, it's fabulous. Mm -hmm. and, and then of course, um, uh, we're, we're working so hard on Clipper and, 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 and Juice to get back there. And, and I, I'll tell you, I think we have successfully avoided answering the question. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we have all our spacecraft equally. You were just, yeah, you were just naming them all and you were just listing them all off, which is fair because, you know, it, it is it's that you can you can sense it in you. It's that strive for knowledge. And that's why, you know, you do what you do and what you've done, what you've done for those so, so many years. It's that strive for knowledge. And it's that, that strive for knowledge that really fires your rockets, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, as we talked about, each one has discovered a number of things for which the next one takes it to the next level. We always build on the previous mission, and that and that makes the the one we're working on the most exciting. Because it's like the unfinished <laughs> chapter, isn't it? It's like you're getting to the chapter, mm -hmm. and just that last sentence, you're like, oh, I wonder what I wonder what it'll say. And so yeah, ten years later. Yeah, but I always want mission. the book never to finish, and that's <laughs> also what happens because you always find something you didn't expect and oh. you haven't planned for. So there's always, always something new to do afterwards. Yeah, always. Brilliant. We've got some questions coming in and um, it was really nice to hear about the sort of the different moons and how they all differ from each other. But um, just to ask this question, is like any moons of the Jupiter made of gas? No. Uh, Short answer, uh, yeah. Not, not completely. Uh, you know, there are what we call tenuous atmospheres. So there's some outgassing going on. Uh, in fact, uh, the reason why uh, Ganymede has aurora is that uh, it uh, has a tenuous atmosphere for which then the high energy particles come screaming down the magnetic field lines and excite. You know, you get oxygen all excited and it, and, and it emits um, uh, in these beautiful um, uh, green green lines, for instance. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it, it's, they have very weak atmospheres or they wouldn't be much fun, but uh, they're not really made of gas. Uh, they're mainly solid and liquid, and then happily the liquid escapes and turns into gas. But that's when the fun begins. <laughs> I suppose still on the sort of the gas subject, um, do we know what gas Jupiter itself is made of? Yeah, we do. Yeah, it, it has. Um, uh, primarily hydrogen and helium. It's enormous. Uh, if, if Jupiter was a fishbowl, okay, you could stick 300 Earths, oh, sorry, 1,000 Earths in the fishbowl. And then, and then when you look at the mass of Jupiter, 
it's 300 times the mass of the Earth. So, so this guy picked up, or gal, uh, picked up uh, atmosphere uh, out of the nebula, primarily hydrogen and helium, but it has other things too. It has no ammonia, it has uh, water, uh, therefore it has yeah. oxygen too. And, and but it also are, has, yeah, it has hydrogen in forms we don't know. Yeah, right. So the, the center of Jupiter, ah. the pressure is so high yeah. that hydrogen becomes solid. I'm sorry for the enthusiasts for gas, but <laughs> even hydrogen can become solid. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's fascinating. So even though the elements that we think we know of, here it is, here's, you know, the universe showing us that we didn't know what we didn't even know. Yeah, in alien forms of the elements we know. And I suppose just as I have a few more questions to come in, another question I've got that's in line with that is, in your experience and and all the things that you've seen, what's been the one most surprising thing that has been discovered on your watch? <laughs> well, the magnetic field of Ganymede is, you, you knew I was going to say that, didn't oh, sure. you? Jim? Yeah, of course. Um, but uh, in fact, I think in the volcanoes of Io, I don't think anyone expected that. No, At least no. I was totally unaware of anyone expecting it. But once it's you've really, seen it, you can't forget it. Yeah, it's I mean, going to be explained and it changes the way you understand these things. Think, I don't know. Think about this. You, you, can, you, you can't walk outside and see a wall of water going up to space station. Okay? It doesn't happen on this planet. But indeed, <laughs> no. on, on these moons, uh, we expect these geysers to go uh, several hundred kilometers. And in fact, um, uh, a, a piece of that escapes, but most of it comes back down, crashing back down to the surface of, uh, of these moons. But uh, indeed, um, uh, that forms um, uh, the E-ring the e of Saturn comes from uh, the Enceladus mission, uh, the Enceladus moon throwing this material out into space. It's pretty spectacular. Unbelievable. Yeah. And you can just tell it's unbelievable. Both of your faces light up with the surprise. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's that moment of when it's like, oh, we didn't know this. Let, let's keep going. We never dreamt like, of it. Yeah. You know, I, the volcanoes, as we just talked about, are more than 100 on, on Io. Some of them will go up several hundred kilometers. I mean, a volcano, several hundred kilometers. Oh, I mean, it's unbelievable. It's also not a nice place to live, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't planning on going there anytime soon, but we do have a next yeah. session coming up shortly where we will be looking at the JUICE mission. And with that Good. in mind, are there any future missions that are planned to more of the outer planets? Indeed. NASA, uh, yep. Yeah, go for ahead, Jim. There are. Yeah, for NASA there are. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the, the, the big pushes right now in the outer planet area is uh, go visiting either or both uh, Uranus and Neptune because uh, only Voyager 2 had an opportunity to fly by those. And so they have some spectacular moons. Uh, these are uh, giant planets, uh, largely gas planets, uh, uh, you know, but uh, they're not, they're not on the ilk of, of Jupiter and Saturn. They're actually what we call ice giants because they have a composition that's more molecular oxygen and uh, uh, hydrogen and, and uh, uh, a lot of the ices. Uh, so uh, those are really gonna be fantastic. Those are coming up. Well, I, I think that there's the same focus on going beyond Jupiter and Saturn in, uh, in Europe too. Um, I would say the odds are in the end we'll collaborate in doing this just as we have in the past, but there you go. Yeah, we have to. I think that's the best way to go. Yeah. I, I love that collaboration. Well, these are long term because it takes a long while to get that far away. It's not just three, four, five years <clears throat> we're talking, well, some of the younger people listening are probably going to take part, but I assure you, I won't be taking part, and I suspect Jim, much as he'd love to, won't be either. <laughs> I'll be watching from afar. Yeah, possibly <laughs> out there. <laughs> yeah. 
that's really exciting now that there's still because some people might think ah oh, space it's all been done what would you say to people that have that attitude <laughs> well, that tells me we have a lot of work to do telling them all the stuff that we know, but all the stuff that we don't know that we'd like to know. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they'll be as happy as we are. I mean, I think the point is not knowing things and exploring things is something that makes you alive. It makes you get up every morning thinking, well, what am I going to do today? What am I going to see today? And so Really, it's an attitude of mind that really believes everything is already known. I assure you it isn't. It and is. if you're a human being with the right attitude, in my view, you're waiting to find out what comes next. It's going to change. And I say that to everybody listening. Uh, it's not over yet. And keep uh, keep watching. <laughs> <laughs> And I think I think your laugh said it all, David, when um, it was like, has, has everything been found? And that was a very much a knowing laugh of a definite, no, it hasn't. Um, and it, it's been an absolute education talking to both of you. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join us. And I'm sure those online will agree. It was a very fun and informative session. So thank you ever so much. Thank you, Fran. Yeah, you're very welcome. Yeah. Brilliant. And it's now time to move on to our last session.